recently got accepted for two talks, uh, a tutorial and a talk. Uh, Randy Coleman uh, from Key Technology on automating small talk bills. Hello. Can everybody hear me in the back all right? I'll try to use the microphone and I might move away from it a little bit here. Um, automating builds is kind of one of my hobby horses, so I talk about it a lot and my coworkers can testify that I talk about it a lot. Um, we've been doing automated builds since probably within the first year after I got the key, we just kind of started automating things. And so this is just kind of kind of half how to half experience report on how we, we automate our small talk builds. Um, I'll give you a little outline of the talk here. I'll do a little bit of introduction, I'll run through a quick example. Uh, talk a little bit about what cruise control is and how we do small talk builds with it and some references and then time for questions and answers at the end. So who am I? Uh, as you know, I'm Randy Coleman. I work for Key Technology. Most of you are probably familiar with Key. Those who aren't, we build big food sorting machines. And uh, so we've got custom hardware doing real-time sorting and all of our UIs are our touchscreen interfaces on the machines and all the UI code is in Smalltalk. We've got the real-time sorting code is in C and we've got some embedded hardware that runs some C++ software. So multi-language development, um, which means that we don't, we can't use just the Smalltalk tools to do our, auto, our build automation and that kind of thing. So we, we've been looking at more cross-platform kind of tools for that sort of thing. Everything runs Linux, probably 60% or so of our code bases in Smalltalk. Um, it's a very good language for us. We've really enjoyed working in it. So why would you want to automate your builds? Um, hopefully most of you know why. My favorite reasons are because I make mistakes. Everybody <laughs> makes mistakes. And it seems to be the time you make the most mistakes or is when you have the pressure to get, get a release out. And if you've got a build with a lot of manual steps in it, you're going to screw it up at just the wrong time. And so the more you can automate, the better off you are. Because all you gotta do is push a button and you get a reliable release up the other end. Your life is much easier. You don't get the late night phone calls and that kind of thing. It's very nice. Um, a few other. So what is continuous integration? Continuous integration is kind of the next step up from automated builds. Continuous integration is one of the practices that Kent Beck introduced when he talked about XP in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, on the first XP project, they were actually using uh, Visual Aid, I believe was Envy. And so what they would do is, every time they had a change to check in, they'd, they'd publish a version, go to an integration machine, uh, integrate it into the main code, and then publish that. And it's very kind of Envy-specific workflow where you can kind of publish code, but it's not actually on the main line, and you go to another machine and kind of merge it all together. But the idea is that rather than waiting for a Big Bang integration at the end of, of the project, you're integrating all the time. The kind of philosophy there is if something is painful and hard to do and, and causes you to grief, then do it a lot more often because A, you get better at it, and B, you streamline it so you don't have so many problems. And with integration especially, the less you have to integrate, the better off you are with the future. So you do integration all the time, continuously. Um, that envy specific workflow when people were starting to learn about XP didn't really translate to the kind of more conventional version control tools like Subversion, CVS, those kind of tools. Um, branching and merging is a real pain. So, you know, doing a publish from your workspace and then integrating on another machine um, was kind of tedious. And so people started to invent some tools for doing this where you check in your changes and you have a tool that sees the changes, does the build, tells you about it. Um, so, I'll abbreviate continuous integration CI here. Why would you want to use a CI tool? Well, one thing is it's it's automatic. It's, it's you know you don't have to do anything. You check in your changes and you automatically get a build up the other end. It's always running, so you don't forget to do something. Um, it's kind of the first step in making sure that your software runs somewhere other than the developer's box. Typically, with a CI tool, you've got a build server running somewhere, and you know kind of the most common mistake people make is, oh, I've got to check that file into version control, or I've got to check that package into version control. It's well done. And so having this, this build running on another machine means that you catch those mistakes real quick. And again, it eliminates yet another manual step. You don't have to do this manual integration process on another machine. There are people that argue that you shouldn't use 
continuous integration tools. The most vocal I, I know of is a guy by the name of Jim Shore, very smart guy, very nice guy, but his kind of philosophy is if you use one of these tools, I mean, you're checking in your code and you might check in broken code, and if you don't know it's broken yet because the build hasn't run yet, then somebody else might check out that code and, and ask the code that's not working. That's a valid complaint. Um, for me, the benefits kind of outweigh that. Um, another one is that it lets you ignore the case when your builds are getting slower. Um, you kind of ignore that because it's running kind of asynchronously. You're not noticing how slow your builds are getting really. Whereas if you have to manually do the integration on all your tests, you realize, hey, this is taking too long. I'm wasting too much time. We need to speed this up. And so you kind of, that feedback is muted a little bit. And another reason why he says not to use these kind of tools is because if the whole team isn't on board with having this kind of automated build thing, the tool can be used to kind of bludgeon your teammates into submission, which sometimes is kind of a nice thing to do, but really it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> seem to work very well, so um, probably not a good idea. So we have chosen to use a continuous integration tool in our shop. Like I said, we have multiple languages, and the way we have our build set up is that we can check in any change to any part of our code, whether it's C, C++, Bash script, expect script, um, graphics, small talk code, anything. And within, depending on how long the various builds take, we've got some builds that run on our hardware and they're a little bit slow. We get basically an ISO image at the other end that we can burn on a CD and take them to our shop and put it on a, a machine that's shipping. Um, it's kind of, we don't have a one button build everything. We have kind of, I like to picture it as feeder streams feeding into the main river and at the other end, when you hit the ocean, you've got this ISO image that people ship. And if all your tests are passing and you've got a complete set of tests, you have what the Scrum likes to call potentially shippable software at the end of every check-in, essentially. And so we've kind of built up our automation over time. This isn't something you just start a project and get it all done within a week or two. You kind of learn what you need and build it up over time. And so in the last it's been six years probably since we started doing this, um, we've got a fairly sophisticated system now. In fact, one of the people that we just hired about six months ago says that one of the reasons he joined us was because of our build system. He just thought it was really cool. So we're, we're pretty proud of it, maybe overly so, but we're pretty proud of it. So let me just run through a little example of what Cruise Control does. On this machine, I've downloaded the Cruise Control binary release, which is available. I'll give you URLs for everything at the end. And installed that. I made one little patch to something that I'll explain when I get to it. But otherwise, it's basically out of the box. Um, I've got a little mail server running on my machine so I can get build notification emails locally. I want to thank Forrest Popoff, who's not here, for suggesting ArgoSoft mail server works great for this. And um, that's basically what I've got running in here. I've got Ant installed. We, used, we started using AMP for our build scripts early on because it was one of the things that Cruise Control supported. Now it's got a lot more support. But we've been using it for six years, so we kind of started early with it. Um, you can use other things to do your builds with. We, we have to use AMP scripts, so I've got that, that installed on here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to VisualWorks. And like Alan said, I, had, I was doing two presentations here. I kind of submitted two because I want to make sure I had one accepted and we did both. So what I've done is I've kind of merged my presentations a little bit. What I did is I got cruise control running on this machine, and then as I was developing my other presentation, I'd check in my changes and get automated builds out of it. And so what I've got set up here is some, kind of, some unpublished code that's ready to, it's, it's passing the test locally and I'm ready to commit it and get a build out of it. So I'm going to do that, show off one, another little tool that we've, we've got called select unpublished changes, automatically selects all the packages that have unpublished changes and then you can just publish them. <coughs> we don't use bundles. I don't want to get into that debate here today. Um, so I think what I did here, those of you who were in my fit, fit tutorial yesterday will know what this means. I'm just going to put a little comment on these. And publish them. Okay. And what's going to happen shortly is you'll see an email notification pop up saying that, oh, my build is successful. At least I hope it is successful. It should be. So what's going on in the background here, I'll get into it in a little more detail, but basically cruise control is sitting in the background and it's watching both my store repository and my subversion repository for any changes. And you can watch, there's, there's support for all kinds of different version control systems, even watching for files to change on disk. And when it sees changes, it'll kick off a build. 
and run the build and then report the results when it's done. That's kind of the basic process. And that's how it works. So we'll just see how this is going here. Yeah, there's a thing called a quiet period where, you know, if you're publishing and it sees a change within a certain window, it's thinking, oh, he's still publishing, I better wait until it's done. So it's just waiting for a second and it's going to start up in a kind of second. So to start building here and we can kind of watch the log. This log is very robust. There we go. So now it's kicking off our build. You can kind of see the numbers popping up as it's going. I'm not doing a headless build here. So. And I'll talk about all the steps we do to build small top code here. I've actually, in here, I've also got builds for basically creating a base development image so that every time I change kind of the core set of tools that I use, I get a new base development image and I can make a new working image from if I want to. I've got another one for I've got another one for building up a, a story image that I use for some of the cruise control stuff. So now if I go to my mail program and check my mail, I got a build. And I actually had an exception in here because it was trying to talk to the server that I didn't have running to run a certain set of tests. All my unit tests passed, and I've actually got it set up so that I've got, I've got it running fitness acceptance tests in the background. And I told it not to fail the build if those fails, if those fail. I don't really want to do that normally, but in this case I did. So it didn't actually fail the build because all my unit tests passed. And this is telling me that. So I get this email from Cruise Control saying, hey, I built this thing. Here's the, the errors that you got. And here's your test results, and here's what actually changed in the build. So you can kind of get a history of what happened. So we actually archive these emails, and we've got history going back for years and years, so you can see when did I do that? And search your mail and find it. It's kind of nice. There's more tools to cruise control provides as well. Um, the one minor patch I made to the distributed cruise control is I modified the style sheet that you write this email so that I get a version number in here, because normally that's not there. So down here at the bottom, I just made one minor little tweak to the stop sheet. I need to actually submit that back as a pass to cruise control server from the base. Okay, so that's essentially how it works. There's more tools to it than that as well. <coughs> okay, so that was my example. So what is cruise control? Cruise control was released open source by ThoughtWorks back in 2001, so it's been around for a while. It's been a fairly long-lived open source project. Uh, it's written in Java, it's kind of Java-centric in some ways, but it's really kind of expanded beyond those roots lately. There are versions of it for .NET and Ruby as well. Those came along long after we started using it, so we kind of, inertia has set in and we kind of stick with what we, what we know, and it works, and it's working for us, so there's no reason to change. It's got a very pluggable architecture, so all the different steps of the build process I talked about are all pluggable, you can, you can do those steps in different ways. And Cruise Control really just provides the tools and the framework for that. And it doesn't really specify how you need to do things. There's kind of three main components to it. The first is the build loops that I've talked about, and I'll talk about in a little more detail in a minute. There's a JSP-based reporting application that I will also show you, which I'm going to show you that right now. So this is actually the JSP based reporting application. It shows you all the projects I've got on here. This bottom one, Connect 4, is actually the one that comes out of the box. It's binary distribution. It's kind of an example project, so you can see how to set up a cruise control project and what it looks like. I just left it in there. But these top four are all ones that I've done. This screen account thing is my example for the fit tutorial. And like I said, these are all little image builder type scripts that I've got. By the way, thank you, Arden, for posting those scripts a little while ago, because those have been really handy for this. He posted some scripts on his blog for automatically building up images, and we, we use them for a bunch of stuff. We've adapted them some. And I've been told that James actually wrote those originally, so I've gone over them very carefully to make sure that there's no changes, <laughs> changes or something there. They work as well as my code. That's why I've gone they have, just as many, <laughs> they have just as many unit tests? Yes. <laughs> they all right. pass. So I can go into any one of my projects here, like my Freedom Account one, and I can see a list of all the builds that, I've, that have happened, and you can see none of them have failed. There's a bunch of tabs up here. This, you'll notice, looks a lot like the build email. Um, 
and it's actually generated from the same XSL. So if I can get more details about my tests, here's all the tests that ran. And notice I had the SU and Q tests in there, so they also ran as part of the build that runs every test in the image. Um, I'll talk about that in a little more detail. And you can look at the raw log file if you want to. It has some metrics, we don't use that much, but they're there. Um, so you can see that all my builds are passed from this project. I switched to another one, I actually did have a failure at some point. Not that one. One of them failed. There. Here you can see I didn't get a build label, so that's actually a failed build. And that's actually because I had a syntax error in my build file in that particular case. But it'll fail the build if your tests fail and that sort of thing as well. And there's a few other tabs here, but you can check <coughs> between projects. And basically, this will show you the history of all your projects. Um, there's a newer kind of reporting application that they put into Crucible for recently. I'm kind of torn on whether I like it or not, but it's called the Dashboard. And so what it just kind of shows you is all the builds you've got to find. You can wave over them and get to a You can click on one, or you can actually go look at your builds, see when they passed, whether it was recently or, or a while ago. Um, you can dive into details on any particular build, like on the Freedom of one, for example. And you can see, uh, here were some modifications in there. I can remember this. Oh, okay. So there's my commit comments, so I know what changed. And there's my build log, I can download and look at that. There's my test, and look at that. So it's kind of the same information in a slightly prettier format. I'm not sure this is as usable as the other one in some ways, and otherwise I like it better. So kind of pick and choose which one you like. You can get them both running with cruise control. And so you get this basically intranet-based, web-based build status that you can go and look at, as well as the emails you get. So those are kind of the three main parts of cruise control. Obviously, the interesting one is the build loop, but you kind of want to see what happens with your builds. Initially, when we started using cruise control for our non-small talk code, and Travis Griggs, who worked with us at the time, one of the same thing for the small talk code, and so he built kind of all his own, and it was, it was <coughs> great, it well. He did. He figured out all the hard parts for me, which was nice, and uh, got it working. But it, it didn't have some of this reporting stuff that we were kind of getting used to having, and so I ended up changing what he had done to make it work for cruise control. So let's talk a little bit more about how the build loop works. So, like I said, it's going to check for relevant changes, and there's all sorts of plugins for all sorts of different version control systems, and now including store. And the latest release of cruise control actually has been the patch to make this work with store. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a minute, but that, they actually accepted that into the project, and the last release 2.7.2 actually has that in there. So you download cruise control 2.7.2 and you've got support for store in there, which I think is kind of cool. They pulled that in really quickly, actually. I submitted it and they had it integrated later that day. I was really surprised by that, but it was, it was kind of nice. Um, then you do your build which would be, you know, compiling, if you have to compile, small talk, we don't have Running the test, packaging, whatever you do. In our builds, we typically check out the code, do whatever kind of build stuff we need, run all our tests, and then we build Debian packages, and that's what we put on our CDs. We just use the Debian and some of the tools to install our packages. And so every, pretty much every build we have produces the Debian package, and we have one last build that builds up our installer CD out of all that stuff. And so, you can look at you know, file system changes, all the different versions of the You can build various ways. AMP was kind of the first one that they implemented, which is why I've been using it, because it was kind of one of the only options early on. But there's, um, there might be one for Rake, although that might just be the Ruby version of Cruise Control. You can just shell out to any kind of a script, um, all sorts of things like that. So it's fairly flexible in terms of how you do your builds. We typically just have a controlling AMP script a lot of our C and C++ code has make files, so we just call make from AMP, and that's how that works. Um, and then, at the end, you publish results, and again, there's a whole bunch of plugins for that. You can send emails, um, I think there's a Jabber notifier, so you can have a, uh, a talk client listening to that. There's <coughs> SS feeds, people who put stuff up to, you know, a little, uh, Build automation, put a little flashing light up on the top of the cube, and so when the build fails, you get this red flashing light so everybody knows the build is broken. <laughs> people have written about this, they use like X10 controllers and stuff like that to do it. That's kind of fun. There's a little traffic light, it goes green or red when, when your build's fast. So there's some really fun stuff you can do with it. Um, like I said, there's plugins for all of that, and there's a few other steps that are kind of glossed over a little bit. Um, all the configuration is done by XML. 
or some of us in our group call, let's call it an X1L, and it's because on the XP mailing list for a while, somebody was subscribed there and they had a uh, profanity filter on their mail server, and so somebody would use a bad word in the forum, and we get everybody get this notification, hey, somebody used a bad word. And so people kind of started adopting the I18N convention for their bad words, so there was STT and, and so on and so forth, people were writing. And so a couple of us on our team call this X1L. <laughs> Yeah. We have others that don't agree, that's okay. But, um, so let me just show you real quick the configuration file. I don't expect you to drop all the details of it. But this is kind of, a, I'll show you the freedom account one, it's the more interesting one. So within the file, you've got project definitions. And it's kind of verbose, as XML tends to be. So this listener thing is basically the interface between the build loop and the reporting application. So you just kind of boilerplate that in there. Just put the build status to a file that the web app reads to, to show you what the build is doing. Um, bootstrapping is kind of a step that runs just before checking for changes so that let's say you've updated a file that's going to affect how the build runs it. You can kind of bootstrap that file. I've actually got this set up so it's actually it's in, a subversion bootstrapper. It's actually going to check out my subversion project as part of the bootstrapper. Then this says, how do I check for changes? And in this case, I'm looking at both the subversion repository and in store. And I'll go into the details of what all this stuff means in a minute. And this is your build schedule. And I want to build, I want to build every minute if I need to. So I'm going to check for changes every minute. This quiet period is what I talked about earlier, where if there's any changes within that period, it's going to wait for things to settle down, <coughs> just in case you don't get atomic commits. Um, so this says, so I'm just going to run AMP to do my build. And I want to generate a log and I want to merge in my test results into that log so that they show up in my little messages. And then this is how I want to publish my results. And in this case, I just want to send an HTML email to myself when that happens. So that's how you configure this. Like I said, this is worry. If you were to look at all these other projects, there's a ton of duplication there. And so they actually provide some facilities for removing the duplication. Um, one of the things you can use is something called XML entities, which those of you who know XML are familiar with those. The other is that you can pre-configure any of the plugins in your project, and you can even pre-configure a project. And so what I've actually got is a refactored version of config.xml, where I set up a little XML entity at the top so I can use it. And then up here, this is all, this whole section here is pre-configuration. This is all the common stuff that I had to do in my configuration. So I've extracted it out to one place. And so if you go in here, you'll notice this project here, all it needs is the basic stuff. It does nothing else. So I just say, oh, I've got a project named that. And it automatically figures out how to do the build. Other ones have a little more to it. This one, I gotta look in a store repository too. This one, I wanna look in a store repository too. And I wanna merge in test results. So I'm using that XML entity I defined at the top. So like I said, I'm kind of glossing over this I didn't actually refactor the built-in project enough to work. So my four projects now, <coughs> from you know, this mess here down to here, has been reduced down to not that much, this much. Yeah, with the common extracted stuff at the top. So those tools they've added from the more recent builds have just been really nice to get rid of all this duplication. To say this is what's different about this build. I guess, uh, like I said, I'm glossing over that one just to show you that if they do make it a little better than your stock, it would be the most So let's talk about that. Um, the other thing there is um, something called Java Management Extensions, and Cruise Control implements that as well. So I can go to another page here, and the UI for this is really ugly, but I can see here I've got all my projects, and if I want to go force a build of something, or I want to change what the build label is going to be next time, or change any of these properties, I can do that here. So let me start that server that I forgot to start last time. I want to make sure my acceptance test actually passed. And let me just force a build without actually making a change. So I can remove that from here. And now we're going to get another build. It's actually already started. You can see back in here. So let's let that finish real quick. It's a pretty quick build. So this time it shouldn't actually die on me. I'm going to actually start it fixed this time. Done. There it is. And I didn't get all that spe spewage up here. And 
There's also fitness will merge in your fitness or sorry, cruise control will merge in your fitness test results as well. And I'm actually working on a better version of that for the reporting application. So you get a few more details of those, but I don't have that working yet. So that's another one I'm going to submit back to the project when I'm done. So if I refresh this, there's my latest build, and I can see my fitness test. What I'm actually adding is a new tape, a new tab here that will actually show you all your fitness tests as well. Just to tie my two talks together a little bit. So that's what the JMX will do. You can actually go in and force the build, or you can pause the build if you know you're going to be making changes or you're going to be breaking something and you don't want it to run for a bit. So you can do all kinds of stuff like that with this kind of remote control. So how do we make this work with small talk? Um, to, in order to check for changes in store, I needed to, because cruise controls were in Java, I actually had to write a Java plugin for it. And I kind of basically followed the model they do for Subversion. What, what, what they do is they make an external call um, to Subversion, ask it for the changes between two timestamps, and it spits out an XML file with the changes in it that cruise control then parses and then reports as modifications. And so I kind of followed that model with, with uh, the store where I shell out to an external program that starts up a visual works image, checks my store repository for changes, uses store for Glorp to do that. Thank you, Alan, for that. Um, it made it a lot nicer than doing it with the regular model. And then reports them back out on standard output by XML, creates the Java plugin that parses those and reports them as modifications in the form of cruise control expense. So that Java plugin is the part that I got integrated into the cruise control project and it's there. And so if we go back to that build or the configuration file for a minute, um, you'll see here that I give store a working directory. It says this is where I want you to do what you're doing. This is the, the script that I want you to run. So the idea is that you write your own script for starting, uh, for running this cruise control image. And this is the repository name or connection profile as it's called in that code. So that's why this says profile. Um, I do something called a version regex because store version strings are basically freeform text. They can be anything. We adopt some conventions in our shop where we use anything that's mainline is an integral version number, anything that's a branch has a dot in it somewhere. Um, and so we just specify a version regex that if it's all digits, then it matches our pattern and we care about that version. If it's not all digits, we would ignore that in our automated builds. It means we publish the work in progress code that we don't want to remain building or something like that. And this is the name of a file that I use to basically keep me from having to go look at the changes in the store repository twice. There's another step I'll talk about in a minute. So when Cruise Control runs, then it, it basically finds all the packages that I want to check and spits out a list of all the, the latest package version that matches my criteria. When Cruise Control starts up a build, it, it kind of grabs a timestamp right up front and says, okay, this build is as of this time. That's to avoid a race condition where it starts a build, but then somebody, somebody publishes while the build is happening, and then you know, then it's done the build and says, oh, well, there's no changes since last time I built, even though there was that period in between where there was a change. So it grabs a timestamp and says, my build is as of this time. So I look for changes as of that time, I check out the code as of that time, and I do the build as of that time. And, and, so, and, then, and so it spits out that list of parcels that match that criteria. And then and a later step uses that file. This is an optional parameter, we use it for what we do. And then within a particular project, I give it a list of here's the top level packages that I want you to, to build. And we use prerequisites to, to pull in everything else we need. So here's an example parcels to build file that got generated by Cruise Control. So oh, I want all these packages. And they're in order from kind of the note, I don't depend on anything else to, I depend on everything. So if you load the packages in this order, you won't have any unsatisfied prerequisites essentially in that order. Um, here's what the store cc.bat file looks like. It just starts up a VisualWorks image. Interesting note is you can't use the, the base image that's in preview because you can't load store into that image because there's some dependencies on tools that are in that image. So we, we have a separate image that starts from visual.am. We load in store, store for Glorp, and package that up and use that for these, this part of the process. Um, I do some source file discarding and stuff. And basically, I uh, 
given a path to load parcels from, tell which parcel to load, and then pass in all the rest of the arguments that came from cruise control. So a very simple script. Um, I'll give the URL of my blog later, and it has examples of a lot of these scripts on there. I've kind of written all this stuff up on my blog, so it's like a picture. Okay. So that's that's how that part of, of the process works. Uh, the next step is to find parcels. We do a build-up style where we start from a, a base image. We have a build for our base image as well that automates loading the base.im, loading a couple things into it, setting parallel strings and stuff like that, and then running the runtime packager to save that out. And we, then we, we start that image and then load parcels into it. So part of our build is to take that load packages from storage, save them out as parcels. And that's where that parcel builder file comes in. Um, like I mentioned, we use prerequisites pretty heavily, and I wanted to show off another little tool that I wrote. Here, this is available in public store where you can get a graph of your prerequisites. So it's not really related to cruise control, but I, I like this tool too, so I have to show it off. And I have sent uh, Mark Corbett and Travis Woods for doing a little bit of work to clean it up. Martin did something where I had it, it was always a horizontal orientation, and Martin made it so that it was smart about whether to choose a horizontal or vertical orientation. It was kind of nice. So it shows you the current package and everything that depends on it. I didn't do a lot of sophisticated control, but it's kind of handy tool to look at the rest. So what the parcel builder will do, that I was just talking about, is um, again we run a little script and it takes that parcel to build file, connects to store, loads all those parcels, and then saves them out, or sorry, loads all those packages from store, saves them out as parcels in the directory I tell it to. And then when we run our tests, when we deploy our system, those are the parcels that we deploy. Uh, so let me show you the build file that does that. Um, this is ant for most XML again. There's lots of debate about whether ant is a, a good use of XML or not. And I think the general consensus these days is it's not. They probably Randall thinks it's from that point. I think I've heard him talk about that once or twice. Um, so I have a, a full build target that cleans, does the build, runs the test, runs the test, runs the test, basic stuff. Um, so here's the build step, which is I make a parcels directory, and I shell out and run a little script <coughs> called parcel builder about that. If this fails, I want to fail my build, <coughs> set the visual works environment variable, and tell it where I want the parcels to go, and parcel builder about that does the rest of the work. Runs that store image again, loads in parcel builder, tells it what repository I want to connect to, tells the file to load, so the cruise control generated for me. Basically, this is an optimization step, so I don't have to go recompute which packages I want. I can let cruise control do that for me once and, and cache it. This uses a file as a cache. Tell it where to put the parcels, and then scroll back, and then tells it to go. So again, this is all documented in package comments and on my blog as well, how to do that. Okay, so that's how we deploy parcels, that's how we do our things. You could, you could do your builds a different way, but this is the way we do it, and so I provided tools for those kinds of things. Um, how do you run your SDMA2 tests? We have another package called Test Logger, and we have a little helper script here that runs our base image. This is the one that we actually ship with our software. Gives it a parcel path, and the, parcel, the main parcel to load loads Test Logger, tells it where to put the results, and tells it to run the tests. And so in, in VisualWorks, we have a test logger package that basically finds all of the SCNet2 tests in the image. You could use it for SCNet as well. We use SCNet2, so that's what I've got built in. And, and then spits out the results into uh, an XML file. The format of that file is the same as what JUnit uses, because Cruise Control understands that. So we didn't have to do any extra XSL work to, to understand those results. And then you get that merged into your build results, and you can see all your the details of the unit tests in that. And again, we have a way of running our fitness tests that um, I won't go into today, but you can you can actually do that as well. It's very similar. You have a script that you run, and this output conversion and that kind of stuff. And that gives you a, a running build. It didn't show any kind of packaging steps here, although we have those in our system where you kind of deploy what you've actually built. So some links. Um, the top one is if you're not familiar with the same called public store repository, that's where you find out about that. And the 
next link is the main page for cruise control. Again, the Java part of this is all there. All the other stuff is in uh, public store repository. There's a cruise control package there. There's a parcel builder. There is test logger. Basically, all the pieces that I talked about today are all available in public store. So you can go look at those. Visual specific, unfortunately, for those of you something else. Um, and then that last link is, is to my blog. And again, I've, I've written written about this uh, last fall or so, I think September, October time frame is when I wrote about this. And that's all I have. A little bit kind of a quick run through. Any questions? Yes? Um, we always load the latest one that matches our version, I guess. Um, can't remember. I believe that if you have specific version requirements, it will respect those, but I don't remember if it does that or not. We don't typically do that. We just say, you know, this package needs that package, and we assume that the latest one's going to work. We try to keep basically our head, our head of our repository to be what we want to work with. So-called head and other versions. That's how we do it. Um, yeah, but can we do a If you make your automated build do stripping, you can. Um, our, the one build we have to fill up our main deployment image, so that's a little bit of that. But it's a big inventory, so there's not much to strip. You can, if you can, actually in 7.6 it's easier to run an icon packager hot and raw in a fashion, and we do that now. Um, so basically you can make your build do whatever you want to do, whatever it needs to do for your, your system, you can do that. Any other questions here? <coughs> We want the to be with parts of exactly where your cruise control specifically with where your optimization. So forgive me if this is a stupid question. But uh, do you for instance <coughs> have a uh, lot of most recent version based on your version system, but could that be easily changed to like the blessing level, for instance? Uh, yeah, actually I didn't show that there is an option for setting the kind of the minimum blessing level that you want to use. It defaults to development, so that's I didn't actually put that in my XML file, but it is there. Um, you can change your version regex if you have a naming convention that you want to follow. For example, for a while we were tracking both 7.5 and 7.6. There's a bunch of packages in public store that we use that were 7.6 specific. So we had a version regex that had an optional 7.6 prefix on it to match all those packages. Or for a while there was the RB4XX stuff. Just change your version regex to match that. But there is also a, a command line option for a minimum uh, blessing level. So if you want to use blessing levels instead, you can do that. And then the one optimization was basically that spitting out that file from cruise control so far as we can order. But these are three separate pieces that you can kind of use in conjunction to do things like we're doing it, or you can use it separately and just use parts of it. Um, Travis Great is actually using the parcel builder and test logger part these days, and he's extending the work with bundles because they don't work with bundles yet, it's just new bundles. Um, and I'm going to be integrating his work as soon as I get a chance for when he's got the stable. So this will support bundles pretty soon as well. And so he's actually, you know, he's grabbing the parts that work for him and leaving the parts that don't work away. So they're all kind of separable pieces. Yeah, Peter? Um, it's a different version of SUnit uh, that Travis wrote a, a number of years ago and he's still a key. Um, the main, I think he's got several goals for it, but the big one from my point of view is that it basically, rather than keeping actual test case objects around in the, in the browser results, it uses tokens. And so if you've got, you don't have to explicitly nail out fake objects that you have, have as instance variables in your test cases that then don't get released because the tool is hanging on to those test case objects. So basically, rather than remembering the whole test case object that ran, remember it's just a token and the results of it. So it can show all the feedback in the browser but it doesn't uh, hang on to the test case object that then hangs up a whole bunch of garbage that you don't want to hang on to. Um, and you know, the, there's the integration into the RV is a little different. Um, make sure that the test, yeah, you get this, this is in 7.6, the new test runner that you, of course, can't see because it turns out showing everything. So let me uh, fix that. So the little test runner down here is part of SDM tools. 
And I've actually done a little extension that I showed up yesterday a little bit. Yeah. So I make a change and save it, it automatically runs my test. <coughs> That's also in public store. I did it as a, a kind of an experiment to see how it felt to have my test automatically run. People talked about it until the XP list, TDD list, about you know, every time you make a change, have it run your test automatically. And I actually find I like it a lot more than I thought it would. I thought it would get really annoying. And that's kind of cool. But that's all SUNIT 2 stuff. It's, it's very similar to SUNIT. Um, the people are working on a bridge between the two, so for SUNIT 2 is incompatible. There's some menu options for switching back and forth, so I can go click, click an SUNIT 2 test down, keep chase. And if I have SUNIT loaded, I can actually convert this to an, S, an SUNIT test case instead. Switch back and forth very easily. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, there is clear case. tests on our real hardware and report the results. We have a set of fit tests that run against the real hardware, check tests on van shells. And this, this guy's pretty much the limit. These are all uh, plugs that are available on your social? Um, not always. I mean, most of the, anything you do as part of your build is pretty much up to you to script it yourself. Um, but if Cruise Control has plugins for calling different kinds of, of build things like and and make and, and any kind of executable and that kind of thing. So actually doing the work um, would be that's your responsibility. Um, if there, if you want to report some extra results that don't kind of fit the built-in stuff, you can go add stuff to the X and the XSL style sheets and that to, to get that information in your build. There is some documentation about that on Cruise Control. So that's a little bit less out of the box stuff. You can kind of get the report the reporting out of there. Um, in fact, that's what I'm doing to get the fitness results showing better is doing some XSL stuff. I have done close to 10 of them. I have Gregory to help me with that. It's amazing. But. So, yeah. So, I mean, you can do pretty much anything you can do in an automated build, you can drive it from cruise control. In fact, when people talk about starting to use cruise control, they say the first step to do is get a build, an automated build that you can run by hand from the command line. Because, I mean, once you have that cruise control, it helps you automate the rest of that process. And then, if you want to do some better integration with different result formats and stuff like that, then that's cruise control. Uh, the bundle support is a big missing thing for a lot of people, which Travis will take care of for me, so I don't have to. Um, it, it works for us. I do find that <coughs> doing modification checks against store is kind of slower than stuff like Subversion. I don't know how to speed that up, really. I can let Alan be my query out for or something. I don't know. But, um, it's kind of working for us. If we plan we're missing stuff, we'll add it. If somebody else wants something added and doesn't know how to do it themselves, I can, I'm more than willing to help and walk people through that. <coughs> I'll put my references back up if you say anybody wants to talk to me as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.